Good morning, everyone. Um, we've got uh, a lot to talk about with Cohen today. We'll see how far I can get um, with the lecture and, and covering this. And uh, I think we probably will need to use some of tomorrow for Cohen, but I do want to plug ahead with our schedule for multiculturalism, um, the Sarah Song article from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Um, I do, I'm hopeful about getting getting to that tomorrow. So. Uh, we'll, maybe we can check in again after to the hour today is up, and we'll see where we're at. Um, I did want to say a couple things. Um, first, um, I had I was on the phone a lot with people last night, and I, there were still some people who uh, I didn't respond to. Uh, one text message I just missed, um, and some other ones happened um, after I went to bed. I've just been exhausted, um, so I need to catch up on some sleep. So there was a few people, you probably know who you are, who sent me a text yesterday night and uh, didn't hear back from me. And um, I want to talk to you today. Uh, I think I have, what could I promise? Probably after 6 o'clock, Wednesdays are my day where I have a bunch of uh, leadership community meeting things going on um, in Seattle that I, I that will occupy me for the afternoon. But then... Uh, in the afternoon, later afternoon, like post six o'clock, maybe something in there, um, I'd be free to get on the horn with people. And it seemed like a lot of people want to talk about papers. Um, so I definitely want to talk to you because we only have a few days left on that. Um, this is a little late in the game, but um, I, I want to get you help as, as much as possible here um, for, for getting those, those papers in order. Um, in terms of picking up... Uh, about um, Cohen. Um, so we were talking yesterday about his first, the, the paper's kind of broken up into a series of little sections that have different arguments um, that they all fit together in kind of a broad narrative here, argumentative narrative, but they're, they're put into these nice little chunks. And the first chunk is just about really defining terms. This is kind of like the setting the stage for for Cohen's uh, paper, like thinking about your own papers, um, this is sort of like the setting the stage thing, framing what what the disagreement is and what the debate is, and actually a lot of what Cohen is up to argumentatively in this paper is just about framing the debate between capitalism and socialism slash communism. Um, how should we understand that disagreement? And as the title of the paper suggests, he thinks that we're operating under some misconceptions and maybe framing it up in an improper way. And that's about right where I'm going to pick it up today. But I do want to do some brief recap here about the first section when Cohen is arguing about definitions of freedom. So uh, as I mentioned yesterday, Cohen's got somewhat of a surprising twist here uh, for, the, for a Marxist. You know, you wouldn't really expect the Marxist to go the route that he does here in terms of defining freedom because Marxists are really preoccupied with um, how under capitalism you get this uh, and, and private ownership of the means of production you're going to get this kind of class warfare situation between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat if you've heard those terms before really the people who own capital who own the means of production, the means of production being like what is able to generate productive economic product, um, like in my silly example of like, I, I've got the factory, right? A factory is a means of production. But also like owning a business that provides a service is owning a means of production. The sort of opportunity for economic activity to take place. There's the people who have control of that, that have the levers of that, and then the people who don't. And the people who don't are sort of coerced into selling their labor for their livelihood. Because under capitalism, livelihood is linked with employment. You have to be able to buy food and pay for rent or buying a house, have a place to live. All the things that you need to survive have to be acquired through economic transactions. You have to have money. And in order to have money, you need to sell your labor. You need to be employed. And there's a lot of like cartoonish versions of Marxism out there that sort of ridicule it or um, don't take seriously, I, I think, or very oftentimes straw man what is being said here. And it's not like uh, Marxists or communists or socialists or somehow lazy people who think it's a front against their dignity to put effort into life and do something productive to like benefit society or something like that. Far from it. 
Um, that is not the, the concern that Marxists have. Um, so but what they are concerned about is how uh, this link of, of livelihood to employment, that you've got the kind of haves and have-nots, that the have-nots are going to be exploitable and are exploited under capitalism. And that contrary to a lot of the cultural norms of capitalist countries, this is not something that should be considered dignified or like uh, a matter of moral, um, a proper moral order or something like that. We'll get into why though. But um, one of the, the, the kind of, I'd say, strokes of genius that, that uh, Cohen has here is that he doesn't try to um, he doesn't try to say that the values, the moral values that capitalism appeals to for its moral justification, why it is like the, a proper social order, uh, like the right, uh, like a conception of it's a model of social justice. He doesn't try to argue against the values that are appealed to, but rather capitalism's ability, comparatively speaking, to execute on that value. So, the that how does this factor into the definition of freedom? Well. When the Marxist is worried about freedom as sort of being free from coercion, this doesn't take seriously what capitalism does accomplish, which Cohen wants to grant. I mean, you can kind of think about this in a historical way. Um, first, you had, um, well, let's, uh, you want to go to like Roman times, there's massive institutionalized slavery of various forms um, that people were under. And then you had a kind of, um, you might, I mean, it's sort of weird to say this, but it's kind of historically true. You have a move to feudalism, which is almost progressive compared to um, the kind of model of slavery that, that um, was very commonly present in Rome, in the Roman Empire. Um, and in feudalism, uh, you know, the serfs are tied to the land uh, of the lord that they serve. But the Lord is also kind of like um, a protector. Uh, there's a um, historian I, I like um, watching lectures from. Uh, he's a professor of history, and he specializes in the Middle Ages, um, the like high watermark for feudalism. And he's like a lot of modern um, people, when thinking about this time and age, they, they call it the Dark Ages for a reason. And it's a lot of that is the because what follows after it is the Enlightenment. Um, and the, these like liberal philosophies that like we've been studying, um, and they tend to look back on feudalism as just like this is morally horrible. But for people that were living in feudalism, being um, in a feudalistic relationship with a lord, as opposed to being a free person, um, like a freeman, um, one who's not tied to a lord, being in a feudalistic system is preferable. There's, as he puts it, it's job security. Right? If something goes wrong, like there's a famine or disease or stuff like that, the feudal lord is kind of going to take care of you. And you've got a right to the land that you're farming or working on, um, and, and you're protected. Uh, you're under the protection of the feudal lord. Basically, um, this is what um, uh, Mill is talking about at the very beginning of On Liberty. I mean, he's talking about this sort of transition to democracy. And, and talking about how there are bad actors, you know, just in the world, um, criminals, bandits, you know, this kind of thing. And so you're going to set up a person with more authority or power, like a monarch or like a, a, like a feudal lord, <clears throat> who's going to protect you from all those people. It creates kind of a little bit of law and order, but they're still above the law. And they can still exploit the people that they are, you know, charged with protecting, basically. Um, I mean, the, the Lord's investment in the serfs is really self-interestedly. They're part of uh, how the Lord gains more income and wealth and power and influence in the world, so they want to take care of them sort of thing. So it's not necessarily altruistic. But there's a transition from this to capitalism. And um, I think Cohen set, sort of would argue that that's also a progressive move. It's a big difference between not being able to participate in say economic transactions because you are just not free to do so this is the social framework does, doesn't give you any power um, the serfs in, in feudalism don't have any power here they don't own they, they have no private property they're just working the land that the Lord owns 
um, and they're given access to it, but they don't really have control. They can't do what they want with it. In capitalism, there's a lot more freedom. The, uh, although every basically every citizen, the market is open to them. It's not uh, only for uh, a small select elite group of society who get to actually wheel and deal and do things like that, right? to express their agency in that regard. It's been opened up, and that's real freedom. And, and Cohen doesn't want to deny that. You know, so he he doesn't like talking about freedom in terms of coercion, although coercion still morally matters to him. But he wants to talk about freedom in terms of what you're able to do. So that's where we get this idea, this kind of uh, funny result, where he says, well, if you're being forced to do something, you have to be free to do it. You can't be forced to do things you're not able to do. So that also shows how it's possible that capitalism can be providing freedom and still have the moral co complications of coercion. So that's that's part of what's going on there. Um, did anyone have uh, kind of questions about this? Anything left over from yesterday you wanted to ask about? Basically, Cohen in this first section is trying to make sure we're all talking the same language here. And that by freedom, we want to talk about what one is able to do. Um, this also might be helpful. Um, being blackmailed or extorted is premised on you actually having freedom that you have the ability to do whatever you're being blackmailed to do, like in my examples I was talking about yesterday. But contrast this with something like um, when society isn't letting you participate. <clears throat> Cohen has a couple really good examples here. One, being a slave. Like, if you're a slave, you don't you don't get to participate in markets, um, and you have a lot of other uh, things that you're not able or allowed to do in society. Like, your, your range of possible options for expressing your agency is very curtailed. But I also really like this example. <clears throat> a foreigner who's denied a work permit. So, if you... If you um, are coming over to this country and you want to get a work visa and the government says no, well now you don't, <clears throat> you're not able to work, not legally. Right? You're not able to work legally. So you're being excluded from being able to participate. And everyone else who doesn't, isn't under that kind of restriction, who's like a citizen of the United States, that could just use us as an example, does have the ability to participate. You know, that's a freedom they have that the person who's denied the work visa doesn't have. They're not able to do this. And the people who are just citizens, they are able. So they have that freedom. Okay. Um, no questions from chat? How are we, how are we doing so far? <clears throat> um, oh, to clarify something that came up, uh, Anthony was asking right before class. Um, Cohen is not saying you have a right to be coerced. <laughs> so it's nothing like that. It's just to say that if you have rights in the sense of there are things that society allows you to do, then those are exactly the things that can be targets for coercion. So coercion and freedom are compatible. They're, they could both be happening simultaneously. That's the point that Cohen wants to make. He's not setting up a, a place of coercion as being a moral ideal here. Um, he's not arguing something like that. Or, or that he's trying to say something like, um, well, if there's so much coercion involved with a communist state, well, capitalism is just as bad or something. It's not a two wrongs kind of argument, um, a two wrongs fallacy. Like a you do it too sort of thing. That's not, that's not, he's not making a false equivalency here. He's just trying to play on the capitalist home turf. And play, he's playing by their definitions and their rules, and he kind of agrees with them. He thinks this would be a better way for Marxists to, to frame their analysis as well. And he, a Cohen obviously doesn't think that this concession really sacrifices much in terms of the arguments. It's actually going to make it easier to see, you know, for Cohen's, from his perspective, the uh, rational plausibility of something like communism. So Mark has a question. I have a question about rich people having greater freedom and poor people having lesser freedom in the ticket example. Um, we're going to get to this in a second. Um, this this uh, idea of how to evaluate what it means to be able to do something in a capitalist free market economy is, is going to be very, very important. But um, maybe, Mark, if you want to throw down what your question is um, 
about that scenario, I, I, I'll i definitely weave that into my, my lecture. Did you have a particular question about it? Or you just want to hear, hear more about it? It was in your written question. Oh, for the reading comments. Um, I don't remember those off the top of my head. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe you can drop it in here, um, and and I'll and I'll weave it in, like I said. All right. So um, the second movement of the article is about um, framing up the debate between capitalist libertarians and their kind of socialist or communist uh, or social liberal uh, opponents and the usual way in which this debate uh, gets framed is that we've got two moral values that we care about we care about um, people's well-being and we also care about personal liberties and these are in tension with each other promoting one can get in the way of promoting the other so we're not going to maybe be able to have our cake and eat it too we might want to have a balanced or moderate uh, acknowledgement of both values being significant rather than being all or nothing about this but the but all these positions are not insensitive to one of the values or the other so it's not like communists don't care about freedom or liberty whatsoever or that libertarians just really are cold-hearted and don't give a shit at all about people's well-being um, any version of those positions that takes that kind of stance is kind of a straw man. It's, it, at least it's, they're way more extreme and way harder to justify. Um, so uh, both, both positions acknowledge both values as being relevant. They would say, yeah, that's a good thing, and it's, and it's morally ideal to promote it. But when push comes to shove, which one are you going to prioritize over the other? That's the main difference, and the libertarian is loath to sacrifice liberties for the sake of people's well-being, and they're like, yeah, it's maybe going to be part of the cost of freedom. <clears throat> Some people can slip through the cracks, that's going to happen, or things aren't going, the quality of life and well-being may not be as high as we might otherwise hope for, um, but that's, liberty is, is more important, Ignot the dignity of agency, even if people use it in inefficient ways, is has to be protected and can't be sacrificed and the social liberal usually is like yeah that's wrong liberty should be prioritized underneath well-being and happiness concerns but that's way more important like what good is it to people being free if they're starving right or they can't get their basic needs met um, or that this is only for some people and not for all people you know things like that so these are all the debates you usually get framed and there, there's a rich conversation there but Cohen is thinking I mean what he's trying to argue here in the second section is that the social liberal shouldn't concede that the libertarian is the paradigmatic example of what it would look like if you prioritized freedom as the most important moral value in deciding social justice so he, he, he's not ready to concede that point to the libertarian, even though it's so commonly identified with that position, that like free market capitalism is the paradigmatic example of what society looks like if you put liberty as the top priority. And Cohen's not so sure about that and wants to argue in the entire paper. So this is kind of foreshadowing his, his uh, big picture argument of ambitions here. He wants to say that's not true. <clears throat> and that actually communism does a better job of promoting people's liberties than um, than free market capitalism, than the than the libertarian mindset, which is definitely surprising. <laughs> it's uncommon to hear someone take this kind of line, and that that's why this paper is somewhat noteworthy. Um, I'm looking at your comment, Mark. Yeah. Okay. So this is exactly what we'll we'll talk about here in a little while. Um, so I want to read uh, a um, quote that um, Cohen quotes in the article about how another philosopher um, defines libertarianism in a philosophical dictionary. And I, I make special note of that because a dictionary is not supposed to be really making uh, substantive argumentative positions or, or something like that. This is usually um, a dictionary is for just like, here's what people are up to. Here's what, what this position is, here's this position, and then we can get into the debate. You know, just kind of clarification of terms and not, not really doing things that have argumentative baggage connected to them. But this is the 
This is the definition that this philosopher Flew uh, provides in a philosophical dictionary. Uh, libertarianism is wholehearted political and economic liberalism opposed to any social or legal constraints on individual freedom. That's how he defines it. And Cohen is like, uh, what? <laughs> this makes no sense as a definition for libertarianism. If you're, if you're thinking about free market, private property, capitalism, that isn't compatible with this definition at all. To be opposed to any social or legal constraints on individual freedom, that's not even po that's not possible under a system of private property. Um, he says this is a misuse of the concept of freedom, or it's starting the if it's intelligible at all. First off, it might just be on the, on the face of it, it's unintelligible. And the reason, so I'll well, yeah, let's do this first. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, <clears throat> the reason it's unintelligible, taken literally, is that if you're going to give private property rights to people. And remember, we talked about rights and obligations are two sides of the same coin. If people have rights, everyone else has obligations. So if society is saying, Tim, Lin Tim Linneman, you have ownership over this mug, you, get, you have complete freedom with respect to this mug, then <clears throat> that means all of the rest of you are under obligations that you are not allowed to mess around with this cup. And the government is going to enforce this. That looks like a social and legal constraint on individual freedom, that you're not able to come up here and use this resource, use this object for your own purposes. You are not free to do so. You are not allowed to. You are not able to. This, the, the social and legal conventions say you don't have that access. Tim Linneman does have that access, but you don't. Okay? Without putting those constraints on individual freedom, property wouldn't make sense at all. That's, that's the first level on which Flew's definition just can't do here. But if we want to understand this not just taken literally and be like, well, what, what does Flew mean by freedom in which that definition could make sense, then Cohen's going to say whatever way you cash that out is going to be question begging. It's going to be presupposing what it's trying to prove. That if there's a debate over, say, what um, what's going to create the most freedom here, um, we can't just define it this way. We can't just define libertarianism as being the one that promotes freedom more. We have to see what, what the conventions are that it's setting up and weigh how much... How much freedom to act, the ability to act, that definition of freedom from the first section, is conferred onto people under a system of private property, and then compared with a system that doesn't have private property or has severely restricted private property, things like that, like more like communism, where more things are communally held rather than privately held. Okay, um, so. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm getting a phone call from someone I cannot talk to right now. Uh, okay, so is this making sense so far? How are we doing? Yep. Cool. So putting putting no constraints on freedom would mean anarchy, and you don't get a system of private property under anarchy. Um, so. Now, that, there's a lot of things in this article that might have sounded like, duh, why are you saying this, Cohen? Or why do we need to, you know, of course that, that is what's going on here. But Cohen thinks this isn't a minor thing. It, we, we should be reminded about it, especially when we're trying to compare capitalism, pri systems of private property versus the alternatives. Um, to be like, yeah, which one really does, pr there is freedom that is promoted. Um, but what kind and in what way and what, what shape does it have and... How much of it is out there? Um, he says uh, the, the first reason why this is noteworthy to, to remark on, even though it seems obvious just conceptually, is that um, we can take for granted the current norms of like how our society is already set up. So because we already exist in a world in which there are private property laws and we're all enculturated into it and we're all used to it and it's normal then it sort of becomes somewhat invisible um, that there's other ways that we could arrange our society or the rules that we could be playing by. Um, and this is what sometimes I think leads to an intuition like that property rights are like natural and inherent and intrinsic. 
rather than that they're the product of a system of social cooperation, that they're conventional, in other words, and that there's other ways we could be doing this, uh, where like um, pr private property seems like the default option rather than one option, and there are other options too, and we need to critically consider them and see which one really does the best. Um, there's uh, and this is a this is a general phenomenon that occurs with um, spaces of rights and, and how people can feel entitled to something that they just have become accustomed to. Um, and I have a little metaphor that I, I like to um, offer, and this is going to get a little bit into what you're talking about, Mark. Um, this happens a lot with privileges, that they become invisible once we've got them. And, and that goes for all privileges, both legitimate and illegitimate privilege. So you probably, I mean, I'm sure you've heard the word privilege thrown around in different contexts. And I think it's all, always useful to clarify what kind of privilege we're talking about. So let's say um, access to education, right? That's a privilege that some people have that other people don't. Some people don't have the opportunity for education, um, either because they don't have the money or because they have to be working because of their impoverished circumstances or because of accessibility issues or any number of things could make uh, access to education something that some people have the ability to participate in and that given the current social scenario other people don't and that's that's a kind of privilege like education gives you some power it also gives you some mobility in society like if you got a degree more doors open up op open up for you or you're able to get into higher wage brackets and things like that right stuff I'm sure you already know um, <clears throat> but uh, we can forget what it's uh, if you're say a product of an educational system like me I've been in education my whole life um, that it can be you don't think about it and you don't recognize what life could be like if you didn't have it or all the resources and powers that you are able to have that other people don't have and that's not necessarily something to feel uh, guilty about in other words that having those advantages is not inherently illegitimate. What you might be concerned about is how not everyone gets to have them, and that the ideal arrangement would be for everybody to have those privileges, or at least have the opportunity, kind of like with Nussbaum's theory from yesterday about the capabilities theory, that at least everyone should have the option to be able to ex have that opportunity and exploit it and receive that kind of benefit and that empowerment. But there are other kind of privileges that don't work this way, like, say, racial privileges or gender privileges, um, ways in which you're given extra advantage on things that like no one should have those advantages. The advantages of education, we might say everyone should have those advantages or at least have access to them, but other sorts of privilege doesn't work that way. Legitimate versus illegitimate privileges. But <clears throat> Cohen's point applies to either type, that it, when you got privilege, you don't see it as easily. But the people who don't have it definitely see it. They see those contrasts. They're like slapped in the face with them all the time. You don't probably even bat an eye about how at any moment you could go down to the 7-Eleven and get a Gatorade. Like you, you can just do that, right, whenever you need to. Just go and do that. Um, or like the privilege of having access, of uh, reliable access to a restroom. Like don't probably don't think about that as being like, oh, man, my life is so good. I can do this. You know, I have the ability to act in this way. But if you didn't have that, your life would be really different, right? You would definitely notice the lack of having that, right? So the analogy I like to use here is um, imagine you're uh, – it's like a board game, like a dungeon crawler board game. So you're like in this dungeon, and there are locked doors everywhere, like maybe a video game kind of like this to a dungeon crawly like Diablo or something. So there's like a labyrinth. And that's like the world, and there's gates on everything. And this is what you get under capitalism. Right? Everything, all the access to opportunity in participating in society has a, a lock on it. And the key is money. Money unlocks those doors. And some <clears throat> locks take, you got to pour more money into them before they open up, and others don't. And if you've got a big sack of cash that you're carrying around with you, then this is almost like just a tedious thing of like, oh, okay, I put the money in there, now I can go where I want to go. And you're really unencumbered for the most part. Right? Maybe you're going to have to start making some decisions about some things versus other things, depending on how much money you have. Um, but for especially the super wealthy, it's like, I just, what do I want to do? That's the real question. <laughs> not like, what am I going to not do so I can do something else? It's just 
I, all the options are open to me. Which ones do I want to do, right? Um, and for someone who doesn't have any bag of money or a very, very small bag of money, then the world that gets presented to them is a bunch of no, 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 no. Right? There's all those barriers up that they don't have, that they're all the places they can't go. That, and those are obvious. When you just get used to the, like, passing out the money to unlock the, the doors, it just, you stop paying attention that you're even doing it, right? It's just a kind of perfunctory thing. And that, that's part of this invisibility of privilege. Reminds me of what's going on with plane prices right now. Um, what do you have in mind, Anthony? You're talking about like airplane tickets? Are they like shooting up? Oh, some people are taking the opportunity to travel even in the face of the coronavirus. Because tickets are so cheap right now <laughs> that it's like all opened up. Oh, uh huh. <clears throat> Uh -huh. Interesting. I didn't know that. I've just been swamped with grading and school stuff. I've been been taking a little bit of look at the news, but I didn't notice that. Um, so the the other thing that um, the other reason why um, Cohen wants to emphasize how there's this link between um, like money access and opportunity and freedom, and that. To have private property means putting all these other restrictions on everybody else's behavior. Why we need to acknowledge that or keep our attention onto it, even though it's so obvious and trivial almost to say, um, is because a lot of times we can moralize freedom. That's the other way that he diagnoses the confusion about what could what could cause a professional philosopher like Flu to offer this absurd definition for what libertarians believe, as if they don't. Um, they don't believe in any kind of restriction on individual freedom by social institutions. How could the restrictions of that capitalism demands be so invisible? And here's how he puts it. And this is a little confusing. Uh, maybe I'll just try to summarize this because um, th this we can get stuck in the weeds here a little bit. But <clears throat> basically, um, one way that you could try to define the libertarian conception of freedom is that freedom is violated only when an unjust interference occurs. And we assume that there's a moral justification for private property. So basically, as a, a pre-theoretical consideration here, um, <clears throat> private property rights are things that people just have morally. That it's wrong, stealing is wrong, period. Like kind of how Locke talks about uh, property existing in a state of nature. I mean, Cohen kind of disagrees with Locke about that. That really property rights are connected with a social system. And before you have civil society, you know, in the state of nature, there is no such thing. So it's sort of like hunter-gatherers, you know, there's not, or like natural com communistic human society. It doesn't have these, like, hasn't set up these barriers about who has access to what kind of thing. Um, so <clears throat> you have that, plus saying that freedom um, is just any unjust interference. So... That's how libertarianism maximizes freedom or is against restrictions on freedom because they're just against any unjust restrictions on freedom and assuming that private property rights are just, okay, like intrinsically or something like that. Okay, the problem here is that the way that most of the time a libertarian wants to defend principles of justice um, or the legitimacy of the private property rights, um, that property rights matter, is on a basis of freedom. So you can't have this circular definition of freedom and property being defined in terms of each other. That's that's really the gist of the objection that you get at the end of the second section of the paper. Um, that moralizing freedom, building into the definition of freedom, a kind of moral restriction on that, is going to entail this kind of circularity. And we don't want to do that. So um, this sort of... If we want to have freedom as the moral value that informs the rest of social justice about how we should set up the rules for society, then Cohen's like, let's just stick to that. Let's just stay with the, the nice, thin, 
clear definition about freedom and liberty that we started with, the ability to act. Okay, that's the key thing. So um, in the third section, um, there's the attempt to maybe say, okay, well, yeah, something like a libertarian free market capitalist economy with private property does put restrictions on people's freedom to protect property rights, but what we're maximizing opportunity for is economic freedom. Okay, so the freedom to do what I want with what I have, which is how we probably think about it. You know, like uh, the libertarian position gives me maximum, like this is like when Rawls was talking about how he thought all these conceptions of social justice had bias to them. The reason why someone who's rich, who has a lot of things, might self-interestedly side with something like libertarianism is because it seems to give them more power to use what they have in society. They don't have these restrictions. Um, there's all these restrictions on market behavior. The market is free, right? If you've got it, you can sell whatever you want, you can buy whatever you want. All that matters is consensual agreements, free agreements between people to make those exchanges with maybe a couple things in there like no slavery or, you know, uh, sex trafficking and things like that, right? There's some things that we're going to put some restrictions on. But for the most part, we're trying to open up as much like do whatever you want in the market as possible. And that's maybe what we mean by economic freedom. And here again, Cohen's just not, not buying, buying the argument. He's not buying the line. And it's a lot having to do with what you're talking about, Mark. Um, the poor man and the rich man do not have the same freedom to buy a ticket um, because of their economic situation. Um, the the part part of it is about, um, but we, we've got to be careful about this. So let's say, so the, the example that's brought up here is um, there's a ticket to see a concert or something like that. And it's being sold on the market, free market, right? Tickets up for sale. And um, there's definitely a barrier here. If there's one person who has the money to put into that door for it to swing open and they get to see the concert, literally, right? The doors of the, the concert hall, maybe, are opened up to them because they have the money to gain access, right? The person who doesn't have the money, that door is shut. Just not an option. They are not free to go into that building. They are not free to uh, witness the concert. That, that access is shut off from them. Um, I think, Mark, where there's some extra wrinkle here from what you're thinking about is what if the poor person, the person who ha is relatively impoverished with respect to the person who is relatively more um, rich, um, still has the money, but they choose not to use it for that concert? Like if they're trying to decide, like, I could go see this concert or I could eat <laughs> you know like those are my two options well i'm not going to go to the concert I, i'm going to prioritize eating um do we want to say that's a restriction of access well in one sense um cohen's like no person's free to do that that's why he i mean he wanted to go even as far as to say that even if someone is being bullied into a certain type of economic activity like selling your labor for your livelihood, um, that that's even consistent with economic freedom, right? Like in my silly example with the factory or, uh, during the recession, I got the jobs, you need the jobs, I'm offering low wages, take it or leave it, it's your choice. I'm not chaining you to the factory floor, you're not my slaves, I, rec I respect your dignity as a self-determining person who can decide for yourself what you want to do. Those are the terms, that's what I'm willing to offer, what, are you, what do you want to do? You know, your choice. Your freedom. Cohen doesn't think that that's morally ideal, but he also doesn't want to say it's a restriction on freedom. And it's going to be less, I mean, maybe this is another way to put kind of Cohen's whole article in perspective here, is that instead of the Marxist saying, you're a slave under capitalism, and you don't have freedom under capitalism, Cohen sort of grants, yeah, there's freedom under capitalism, but not very much of it, or not, not compared to communism you could have more freedom under communism so he's more wanting to make a positive argument for how an alternative social arrangement would give you more freedom than to say that the existing one 
is like taking away all of your freedom or, or something like that, right? So he's, he's hesitant to say something like an act of coercion is really a violation of freedom. It's not. And if I'm sort of just thinking to myself and deciding, well, what matters more to me, eating or going to see this concert? And I'm like eating, survival, then I'm going to make that decision that that was still a free action. There's a big difference between that situation and someone forcing me to, to basically say, I don't care if you got the money for it, you're not coming into this concert. That would be different, right? If you're just not even allowed to. And that, that's happened before, right? Um, we've, there's been examples of cultures in history and currently today where even if you have the money, you, that social arrangement, that cooperative system of institutions doesn't give you access because that lock is not unlocked with money. It's unlocked with something else, right? The, the access to things in society could be gated in all sorts of different ways. Maybe you need to be part of the, the right ethnic group. Um, or religious group or something like that, right? There can be these barriers that are up that restrict people's freedom, your ability to do things. So <clears throat> when it comes to economic freedom, um, the main point that Cohen wants to emphasize about the limitations on freedom that are present there is that while in principle the market is open for you to do, for people to do whatever they want to, in practice you need to have the resources to be able to participate. So not just in terms of the personal choices or contrast that's involved here, but also in terms of the um, just the, the ability to do it. Like, I can't sell your stuff on eBay. I'm not allowed to do that. <clears throat> that's a restriction on my participation with the market, right? Um, I like this quote from Cohen. I want to read this to you. It is scarcely intelligible that one should be interested in how much freedom people have in a certain form of society without being interested in how readily they are able to exercise it. So while under like the theoretical model of a free market, I could buy and sell anything. In practice, I can't, right? I can only sell the things I own, and I can only buy what I can pay for. Right? Th those are the practical restrictions on what I am able to do, which is the definition of freedom that we're using. That, that's the one that the libertarian wants to be using. Um, okay, so the reason we care about economic freedom is for the things that we're also able to buy and sell. Right? That's, that's why we would want to have it. Um, another, uh, I, I know, I, I, actually, let me get you the code before I forget here. Um, oh, what's going to be the code today? Um, Pegasus. Pegasus is the code for today. Pegasus, the winged horse, right? That's, that's, the, that's it. So a um, good example here would be, um, uh, shoot, I just lost it. Um, oh, Hayden has a comment in here. My grandpa grew up poor, and he always reminded me about how privileged we are because he worked hard to get where we are today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, he's like, the world was setting up all these barriers, and I was able to expand what you're capable of doing, what you actually have access to because of all the hard work I've done. Basically, um, he had to, to wrangle the system into one that created actual practical opportunity for you. Maybe that's, that's part of what he's trying to set you up, to have more freedom, more ability to act than he did. Um, but it's also noteworthy, and Cohen isn't going to gloss over the point that in a capitalist system, there is the liberty to do that, right? You you are allowed, in principle, access. But practical access is the real main thing for that to mean anything. So imagine that you are homeless and on the street, you don't have a penny to your name, um, and you're living in a, in a free society, in a free market society. Um, are you just going to be like, man, it's awesome to just know that if I had a bunch of money, I could buy that building. I could have ownership of that if I just had the money. It doesn't mean anything to you, right? The no, the idea that all the doors in society, in my like uh, metaphor of the labyrinth, right, with all the locked doors, the fact that all those doors are doors that could, in principle, in theory, be open, is some comfort, maybe, but it's not. It's not the thing that we really care about when we care about freedom. We don't care about just the in-principle possibility of action. We care about actually having the action, 
um, what good is that if you you can't actually participate with it because of those gates, the money gates that happen? Okay, so now we've got a, a at this point in the paper we're about halfway through and we've got a a nice cleaned up framed up discussion about if we care about using freedom as a way of deciding what social order or arrangement of social cooperation we want to have in society that we want to set up, um, the the metric of freedom the appeal to the moral value of freedom has to be looked at in terms of how much ability to act does that system confer onto people? How much uh, range of actions are actually practically available to people? What are they able to do under that system and what are they not able to do? And I really appreciate the next section of the paper. Um, this is, this is um, one of the most responsible ways of approaching this debate that I can imagine, that it's not over, over arguing one side here, or Cohen thinking that he's got better arguments than he does, but he's sort of recognizing the natural difficulty of a debate like this one, about how to compare systems for some, like how do you quantify freedom in this situation? Um, the next section is where he starts moving into comparing capitalist and socialist systems of society. And he talks about, maybe you remember that metaphor about the Jeep and the sports car? That's what I want to talk about next. But that's, it's just a really honest, like, recognition of the problem that we're up against in this debate. And that's the kind of thing that I definitely encourage for you as you're working on your papers. Make sure that your paper has a, a really clear-sighted acknowledgement of the problem of your rational controversy. And don't try to minimize it as if it's way easier to resolve than it actually is. Um, if it was so easy to resolve, it might not be a good paper topic, right? We need a rational controversy, and uh, you don't have to pretend like all of this is much easier than it actually is to clear up. Um, it might be a really difficult and challenging problem. And so that's what we'll pick up tomorrow. Um, in terms of where we're at, I think um, I think we're, we're going to be able to get to the multiculturalism paper tomorrow. We've we're definitely got some stuff to talk about with Cohen still, um, but I, I think we're going to make it. I think we're going to make it. So let's still have reading comments due tomorrow. Um, if, if you're not able to put it together, I know it's the end of the quarter and it's busy, but um, try to at least get started on that reading, um, uh, and, I, and I think we'll be able to start it in class together. Okay. Um, hope everyone has a good day. I'll let you go now. You got the code word? We're good? Anyone has some questions here? I, I'm able to hang around during the break.